24 years old, locked in the back of a cop car having a panic attack, unable to breathe as police officers outside the car laughed at me. How did I get here? That's a story 20 years in the making. I'm a gay man. Anywhere between 10 and 20% of Americans are also LGBT. And millions of other Americans identify as being part of a minority group. But one thing holds common. Minorities of all varieties face unique obstacles to accessing health care. Whether it's a black man in Washington state seeking mental health services, or an immigrant woman in Minneapolis seeking postnatal care, obstacles exist. In elementary school, I was an effeminate little boy. <laughs> and I was bullied every day for something I couldn't control. My experience of school involved meticulous planning in order to avoid the kids who called me a faggot or pushed me into lockers. Eventually, when most kids would act out in class or go to their parents, I attempted suicide in fourth grade. A few days later, I disclosed to a counselor, and instead of feeling understood and listened to, a shitstorm ensued, one that left me feeling completely alone, lost in a crowd, and noticed by no one. The response I received came as a multifaceted intervention, one that involved psychiatric evaluations, social workers interviewing my family, and missed class time in order to meet with school counselors. Unfortunately, the bullying that caused the problem in the first place was never addressed, and it never stopped. Sadly, this is not uncommon. Minorities' cries for help often go unaddressed, and their illnesses unmanaged, culminating in explosive events later in life. Instead of finding treatment, they're more likely to end up homeless, addicted, or dead. At 21, I was living in the big city. Two men drugged and raped me. I went to the hospital and reported it to the police. And the first words out of my detective's mouth were, we have these gay boys that go home with each other every night, wake up with their wallets missing, and expect us to do something about it. Discrimination, be it overt or subtle, leads minorities to mistrust the very systems intended to provide protection in a time of crisis, leaving us wondering, where do we go for help? In graduate school, at age 24, I was learning to live with post-traumatic stress disorder, going to individual and group therapy and taking medications. But eventually, I exploded. A few weeks before finals, I found myself crying, unable to sleep, shaking, shutting down. So I reluctantly headed to my campus's psych center. Instead of finding compassion or care, they called the police. From the back of a cop car, I was laughed and mocked at as I begged to be let out. Hours later, I found myself in a psych ward. If someone had listened to that bullied fourth grade boy instead of labeling him, perhaps I could have paid better attention in class. If someone would have advocated for that 21-year-old man, perhaps I would know what justice looks like. If someone had listened to that distressed graduate student. But that's where we come in, as individuals working in the public service. As mothers, brothers, sisters, we can make a difference. But we have to change our tools and how we use them. If we can learn to listen with empathy and compassion and without labels, we can change lives. My life could have been changed. But this isn't just my story. It's the story of many. It's the story of millions. Millions of people let down by labels. Dr. Martin Luther King once said, whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And I know it has certainly affected me. And I hope in some small part it also affects you. So let's promise to do one thing when we leave the National Council's conference. The next time you're greeted with someone else's story, listen openly with compassion and empathy, and you can make a difference. Let's commit to listen 
without labels. Thank you.